Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring psychedelic research and in particular DMT. With me is Dr. Rick Strassman, who is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico. He is the author of DMT, the Spirit Molecule, a doctor's revolutionary research into the biology of near death and mystical experience. He's also written a novel called Joseph Levy Escapes Death, and he is the author of Inner Paths to Outer Space, Journeys to Alien Worlds Through Psychedelics and Spiritual Technologies, and most recently, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, A New Science of Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Scriptures. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. You know, as I read uh, your book on DMT, the original book, uh, for which you're famous, uh, really, uh, as a DMT researcher, but what surprised me in reading that book is how much original psychedelic research had been taking place before 1970 when it was pretty much made illegal. Uh, well, that's true. For maybe two decades, psychedelics were the golden boys of psych of psychiatry and psychology and psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was studying them. They were bound to revolutionize mental health treatment and the understanding of psychopathology. Yeah, but uh, then the crackdown occurred and the uh, Controlled Substances Act of 1970 uh, placed psychedelics, LSD, DMT, into the most restrictive legal category, and uh, clinical studies stopped. Mm -hmm. At the same time, animal uh, studies continued. Uh, our basic understanding of serotonin and antidepressant drug treatment uh, was determined through the use of LSD in certain animal models to mm -hmm. explicate the serotonin system. You know, so, you know, there were a lot of advances in our understanding of the you know, pharmacology of the psychedelics in the intervening 20 years between them ending and our study beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, so one of the, you know, boons of that long a, you know, delay between the end of the studies from the 60s and ours was we could say we need to confirm the animal data. We need to understand if what occurs in the lower animals with their brain and serotonin receptors is also taking place in the human. So when you began your research, in, uh, actually, as I recall, about 1988, it took two years to get it approved. Uh, it was after a hiatus of 20 years where research on human subjects with psychedelics was simply not taking place, at least in the United States. Right. And that's why it took so long to get the permits and the approvals mm -hmm. was uh, there hadn't been any good scientific research proposals you know, submitted uh, to study psychedelics in humans. Everybody thought it was impossible. Uh, you know, so there was a lot of uh, working with the DEA and the FDA for them to you know, talk to each other mm -hmm. to figure out how to you know, deal with the Schedule One issue, the restricted legal category, and the you know, safety issue. Uh, you know, can you do good you know, science with psychedelics in humans in a safe manner? And FDA had to determine that, mm -hmm. and they had to you know, sort through all of the older literature. I know one of the issues at the time was that, you know, LSD and other psychedelics had, had become a, a mass social movement. And uh, I think uh, some of the researchers who were responsible for funding this sort of thing were very concerned that you or your colleagues might want to engage in a research project in order to provide a supply of drugs for yourself. Well, I think that's one of the you know, fallouts that occurred with Leary and his Harvard group, mm -hmm. is that uh, it became a party. 
uh, no longer was really research, and that alarmed the regulators. Even the researchers can't control the use of these drugs. Yeah. So um, there was a lot of notoriety around LSD in particular, you know, somewhat around you know, psilocybin mushrooms. But there wasn't much known about DMT. It was rather an obscure psychedelic, which was another appealing you know, feature of the compound that led me to decide to study it. A DMT is a very unusual psychedelic in the sense that it's it's so very powerful. Its effects are short lived, and also I gather it's found in the human body and found inside of many many other plants and animals. Yeah, it is a unique compound at a number of levels. Uh, I began with my interest in psychedelics with um, questions about the biological bases of spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought maybe, uh, well, I was going to college in the 1970s on the West Coast, and there were a lot of drugs, and there was a lot of meditation coming in from the East. Yeah. And I was really struck by how similar the descriptions were of those two you know, separate syndromes. Mm -hmm. And I thought there must be some common biological denominator that's activated by the drugs or activated through the meditation practice. Mm -hmm. So I thought there might be some part of the brain or some chemical. So uh, I started off with the pineal gland, which m makes melatonin. This was the mid-1980s, and there wasn't much known about melatonin in yeah. humans. And there were some early data suggesting that it was quite mind-altering. Uh, that was quite you know, psychedelic. It might stimulate dreams and whatnot. Uh, but our study didn't determine much with respect to its psychedelic effects. It was you know, mostly sedating, which is now how it's used mostly mm -hmm. over the counter. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I had learned about uh, the drug DMT or the compound DMT, yeah. um, which is also endogenous. It's made in the human body. It's quite psychedelic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been found in hundreds, if not thousands, of plants, in including ayahuasca, which is a psychedelic brew. Uh, from the Amazon. That it's increasing. sort of considered the main active ingredient in ayahuasca, I believe. Right. It's what you could call uh, um, you know, the visionary ingredient, mm -hmm. uh, the, the compound responsible you know, for the visions. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, so once I learned about DMT, I thought, well, that would be the drug to study. In other words, if you gave DMT and it replicated features of non-drug spiritual states, one could argue that increases in the you know, natural production of DMT mm -hmm. corresponds to those non-drug states. So ours was a descriptive study. Uh, there wasn't any psychotherapy involved. Uh, there were normal volunteers. Uh, I just was interested in you know, characterizing the effects, biological, mm -hmm. psychological. So what I gather from what you're saying is that you had an interest in understanding the biological basis of spiritual experiences and and how DMT may be even produced in the pineal gland in, in the brain naturally in humans could be responsible for that. Right, right. If, you know, somebody is perhaps, you know, meditating in a cave and starts to experience visions, one could speculate that if those you know, visions are like a uh, uh, you know, DMT experience, you know, like you give DMT and you have those visions, you, and you meditate for months, you have those visions. If they're the same visions, it makes you know, sense that endogenous or naturally produced DMT would be mediating those visions from meditation. It certainly looks like a good working hypothesis, but I assume that when you went through this uh, two-year bureaucratic process of getting uh, many government agencies to approve your research and then to obtain funding and to get clearance from the university and from the Human Subjects Committee and uh, all of the many safety features that have had to be taken into account. Um, you didn't necessarily emphasize your interest in uncovering the biological basis of spiritual experience. No, no. Our study was just, well, it, it was a, what's called a psychopharmacology dose response study. Mm -hmm. uh, you give small doses, medium doses, high doses, and placebo. And uh, you look at the psychopharmacology of the drug. In, in other words, uh, the biological effects, the you know, pharmacologic mm -hmm. ones. In our case, we took a lot of measurements of blood hormones, uh, cardiovascular parameters, body temperature. Uh, 
And we speculated all of those would be under the regulation of specific kinds of pharmacologies, especially of uh, the serotonin system. Mm -hmm. uh, and the you know, psycho part was to characterize the subjective experience. Uh, what was it like in there? Um, and we developed a new rating scale to quantify the subjective effects. Um, you know, so the, you know, rationale for the study, you know, the way we were able to get it approved was we pointed out it had been 20 years since human studies had occurred. And in the meantime, a lot of animal data had been generated. You know, so we needed to confirm or refute, you know, the animal data. Uh, the other was in the early days of DMT research, there were beliefs that it was in, involved somehow in psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you know, somebody who's schizophrenic might be producing too much DMT, or their response to it is abnormal, or yeah. they're not clearing it as fast as normal. So I, you know, brought in that argument mm -hmm. you know, that we still don't understand schizophrenia, and this was a good theory, and the research ended prematurely. Yeah. The you know, third point is that uh, you know, psychedelics are abused. Um, LSD can be abused. You know, psilocybin can be abused. And uh, we wanted to really hone in on one psychedelic that wasn't that well known, but is kind of the you know, simplest mm -hmm. of all of the psychedelics, structurally, chemically. Um, so we approached it from the drug abuse angle as well. We got our first grant from a schizophrenia research foundation, the Scottish Rite Foundation mm -hmm. for Schizophrenia Research, a branch of the Masons. And we got a grant from NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, and these grants came in bef you know, before we got permission. Mm. Everybody wanted the studies done, but it was so hard to get the uh, you know the regulators in line and agree to mm. allow us to make DMT and to give it. Mm. Now, the interesting thing about your your work to me, or one of the interesting issues around any you know, psychedelic drug ingestion, is what Timothy Leary used to call set and setting. The, the mindset that people have and the environment. And you did all this research actually in a, a research wing of a hospital here in Albuquerque. It was on the fifth floor of the clinical research uh, center. Uh, it was an experimental chemotherapy ward as well. So, uh, you know, we had a room reserved uh, for the studies, you know, most of the time. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes if that room were occupied, we did studies in the orthopedic room with a cage <laughs> where, you know, people get all hung up by, mm -hmm. by you know, pulleys and ropes and things. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it was a pretty grim setting. Uh, but at the same time, it was, you know, safe. You know, the volunteers felt safe. Mm -hmm. um, in my informed consent document, you need to spell out all the worst case scenarios. And one of the things we had to include, which I had picked up from talking to people who had smoked DMT previously, is you leave your body and you may think you've died. You know, that's kind of the yeah. worst you know, psychological reaction. Mm -hmm. So in the informed consent, uh, I say you may feel like you've separated from your body and that you've died. Uh, but, you know, no deaths have been reported. And you know, besides, you're in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And if anything goes wrong, we can respond immediately. So you paid a lot of attention to the question of rapport, and uh, even though you're in a kind of clinical setting and not not a party room or anything like that, uh, you you really tried to uh, make sure that the research subjects were uh, comfortable interacting with you and your staff. Yeah, I think you know because the environment itself wasn't that um, friendly, mm -hmm. engaging. Uh, you know, the relationship became even more important. This research continued for uh, quite a few years. Around five years. We started mm -hmm. November 90 and wrapped up around September 95. So during that period, you administered, I'm, I'm guessing, well over 100 DMT sessions. Well, we studied around you know, five dozen volunteers. Mm -hmm. We gave about you know, 400 different doses of DMT mm -hmm. over the space of those yeah. you know, five years. And as, as I recall, you were also researching psilocybin. We just began giving psilocybin mm -hmm. um, toward the end of the research. Uh, I wasn't that comfortable with a longer-acting drug in a hospital yeah. room, small hospital room. Uh, in that case, it's important to have 
some you know natural beauty around you, some comfortable furniture, quiet, smells nice, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. But the ethics board was reluctant for us to take that research out of the hospital yeah. giving psilocybin. You know, our studies were so far ahead of the curve mm-hmm. that nobody knew what to make of what we were doing. You know, so on one hand, the ethics board was quite, you know, liberal. Like, you know, we're not playing God. You know, just be careful. Mm-hmm. But as you know, time went on, they became increasingly cautious, wondering, you know, what I was doing back there. You know, so when we wanted to, you know, move the study out of the hospital, there was some resistance. Uh, yeah. You know, so we just said, okay, let's just, you know, start working with, you know, psilocybin and, you know, see how it goes. Because mm-hmm. a psilocybin experience can run five or six hours, I believe. We were giving pretty good doses, too, and those lasted eight hours, nine mm-hmm. hours. Yeah. An LSD experience would be even longer than a psilocybin experience. And a DMT experience, on the other hand, is relatively short. Right. Well, you know, speaking of LSD, we got permission to use LSD. Mm-hmm. And I had LSD here. Uh-huh. Uh, but we never you know, got off the ground giving that. With the you know, psilocybin work, they wouldn't you know, let us uh, you know, take the study out of the hospital. And, you know, there were some, some problems. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just said, you know, this isn't going to work. With, you know, in, and in you know, some ways, that was one of the reasons we ended the research. Altogether. Was, yeah, because if I was going to be giving psilocybin, it had to be out of the hospital. Yeah. And they weren't going to permit that. Yeah, well, the uh, well, the time course of DMT is quite short. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, it's usually smoked in the field, yeah. like if you recreationally are using it. Um, in which case it comes on in maybe three heartbeats, four heartbeats. That's very fast. Very fast. Yeah. In, in our study, we you know gave it intro you know, muscularly first. We were thinking because that was the way it had been administered in previous mm-hmm. studies. But we were interested in replicating the you know, field effect. You know, what's it like to smoke? Uh, you know the you know the. Uh, uh, so the rapid time course. The rush that you get. Yeah, yeah, the rush is appealing mm-hmm. uh, and is one of the things that draws people to its use. Mm-hmm. And that occurs when you smoke it. We wanted to see if it occurred when it was given in, uh, intramuscularly. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and so we brought two volunteers in who had smoked DMT before, and we gave them the intramuscular, and it was just too slow. You know, so we called FDA and said, can we give it IV? They said, yeah, just, you know, you begin at a lower you know, mm-hmm. dose and just, just build up. So you had to begin by calibrating what are the appropriate doses for IV injection. Exactly. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, on the way I was, you know, trained in, uh, you know, psychiatric residency was to give slightly, you know, too much of every medication you prescribe mm. uh, because you'll understand it's, it's, you know, maximal effects and, you know, the side effects. And once you've, you know, gone, you know, beyond the maximally tolerated dose, you back down. You know, so we gave, you know, uh, you know, two of the volunteers a little too much DMT mm. and they couldn't remember, you know, what had happened. Uh, they just kind of blacked out. You know, so, you know, so we, you know, dropped the dose down by about a third mm-hmm. and, you know, that was our high dose. And when you give it intravenously, it begins within a heartbeat or two. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, crinkling high pitched kind of sound as the room breaks up in uh in pixels and uh then uh, within 60 or you know, sec- you know around you know, 60 seconds or so you do feel like you have you know, separated from your body after a high dose and uh you know that was when it was important to you know keep on the eye shades uh mm-hmm. if pe- if you know people would open up their eyes, and there would be this overlaid, you know, DMT experience over mm-hmm. the research room, which was very disorienting. In, in other words, all kinds of visual patterns overlaid a, 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 on a hospital room environment. Right. You know, so it was quite important for those to keep their eyes closed. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it was just too confusing. And, and I gather that this rush, the really intense part of the experience, uh, takes only a minute or two and occurs right at the beginning of the session. Yeah, it isn't even a minute. I'd say, you know, 45 seconds or so. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, more or less a minute. Yeah, and it's a feeling of internal pressure and of acceleration, Mm -hmm. uh, which is intolerable. 
you know, the body cannot hold it, and which is why I think as a response, like a you know, protective response, the mind just you know, separates. And this is the point at which people begin reporting on, on DMT. Uh, a very, the most intense uh, psychedelic experiences, some of your subjects even said the best experience of their whole lives. Well, you know, clearly for the majority, the most intense. Mm -hmm. uh, we only studied experienced psychedelic users uh, because we were interested in, you know, good reports from people that, you know, knew the territory. Yeah. We also thought the effects of DMT were going to be so strong and so strange, we wanted experienced people so they wouldn't panic. Yeah. They'd be able to, you know, manage the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, you know, so, you know, so the majority of them had you know, taken LSD, you know, mushrooms. Some had taken you know, peyote or you know, pure mm -hmm. mescaline. But uh, you know, by and large, a big dose of intravenous DMT would have been their most intense you know, psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. A couple of people had, you know, I mean, either you know, no response or quite a you know, mild response. You know, so in you know, their cases, it was not the most intense psychedelic experience. One of the most unusual features of, of DMT, and I think in, in this regard it differs from LSD and psilocybin and mescaline, is that people reported uh, dialogues and encounters with other beings, beings that seem to them to be absolutely ontologically real. Yeah, you know, the whole question of the beings is just so complex and fraught. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting because you know, before I began my study, I interviewed uh, almost 20 people that had used DMT. Mm. And I said, you know, what's it like? What should I expect? I'm putting together a questionnaire. What items should I put in there? And everybody said there's these beings in there. There are these things, these, these humanoid things or angelic things or space aliens mm. or plants or statues or whatnot. You know, planets that mm -hmm. are there, they're entities, they're, you know, sentient, they have will, mm -hmm. they have power, and they communicate with you, and you communicate with them. So I said, oh, that's, you know, very interesting. I included it in, in my questionnaire, but I wasn't expecting the frequency of those reports once the study got underway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very common, at least 50%, you know, um, I'm encountered discrete, you know, beings. And even if they weren't discreetly discernible, there was still an intelligence that suffused the environment, the psychedelic state. So I suppose to, to understand this properly, we have to appreciate that these people are first experiencing a separation of their consciousness from their body. So that it's as if their consciousness is entering into a, another space completely, a non-physical space of some sort. Yeah, completely disjunct from this reality. An interesting aspect, though, is it feels more real than everyday reality, mm -hmm. even though it's completely unexpected, completely novel, but still it arrested their attention even more than everyday reality mm -hmm. did. They were convinced of its reality, you know, that it was an ongoing kind of, you know, parallel, you know, level of experience. Like a parallel universe. Right, right. I started looking into parallel universes after uh, you know finishing my work because I was trying to understand you know how could this happen? Yeah, and uh, I guess that th that experience of being in this parallel universe and interacting with these beings uh, it continues for a while beyond the initial rush, beyond the first minute, maybe for ten or fifteen or twenty minutes mm -hmm. thereafter. Right. Um, well, you experience uh, the intense, you know, rush the, f the first minute or so, mm -hmm. and you're pretty anxious and a little bit confused what's going on exactly. You're still establishing your bearings and orientation. And if you can negotiate through, you know, the rush, you know, comfortably, uh, then it's pretty much smooth, you know, sailing after that. But uh, in, in, in either case, if you've resisted and are having a difficult time or you've accepted and you're into it quite comfortably, you're completely, well, the ongoing reality is completely replaced mm -hmm. by the DMT reality. And that peaks at about two minutes mm -hmm. uh, and you're there. Uh, and you're just trying to pay attention yeah. and, you know, get your, and, you know, get your bearings. Mm -hmm. And it's around, you know, that time, you know, that the beings appear uh, and you do what you can with them. And then... 
they start you know fading away maybe the 10 minute point mm -hmm. 12 minute point after the injection yeah and you're completely normal in a half hour you're drinking tea well you're slack jawed mm -hmm. you know, from the experience but you're drinking tea yeah uh, you know having a normal conversation answering rating scales i understand from your book that after about 15 minutes, uh, people are starting to come down from the intense part of the experience. They can, that's when they can begin to talk about it and describe what they've been experiencing. Yeah. I usually would make sure we began talking in about 20 minutes. Mm. Uh, you know, some people wanted to start, you know, chatting right away, mm. maybe the you know, 10 minute point. Uh, and, you know, uh, speaking of, you know, the consciousness, you know, separating from, you know, from your body, we took a, uh, machine blood pressure cuff reading at the you know, two minute point and, uh, and you know, five minutes after the injection. Usually after the high dose, nobody felt the blood pressure reading at, you know, two minutes mm -hmm. and it exerts an iron grip. Yeah. Yeah. And they weren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, some were aware of the reading at the, you know, five minute point, mm -hmm. but, you know, people were really dissociated. Mm -hmm. Um, and once they started coming down, maybe the eight to ten minute point, you know, they were so excited they wanted to start describing what had happened. But I would, you know, ask them to st stay inside, you know, focus on, you know, the return until maybe 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, you know, like to luxuriate in the post DMT state mm -hmm. for another 10 or 15 minutes. But, you know, 45 minutes is like, you who? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So, these people all had, I gather, unique experiences. It's not as if you ever had two people reporting that they were in the, the same place. No, no. But still, you know, there were more you know, similarities than not. Mm -hmm. it, it, what, I, I suppose an analogy would be it's, um, it's like going to India. Quite strange, quite you know, foreign. You know, you know, but there are you know, different cities mm -hmm. and states and regions and whatnot in India. Um, but, uh, the state itself was pretty uniform. It was brightly colored, you know, discarnate, you know, full of content, you know, visions, information. There was, you know, some auditory effects. Uh, usually there was an ecstatic, you know, feeling, just, you know, so expansive. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, there was an absence of any emotion, which was an interesting thing. It was co completely dry and, you know, technical. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people, got scared, but just one or two, actually. It was a pretty hardened group. You know, there was, you know, the uniformity was its, you know, visual preponderance, I suppose. And the, you know, the fact that it was, you know, full of content. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't empty. Uh, it wasn't a unitive state where you're, you know, one with all. Uh, I mean, you know, there was a lot going on mm -hmm. and you had to pay attention. Well, I, I gather from what you're, how you describe it in your book, a quite a wide range of experiences. Uh, but a number of the research subjects reported experiences not so different from a classical near death account. You know, there was one particular volunteer, um, who was a nurse who loved to study the near death state. And, you know, she wanted a near death experience. It was her life dream. And she was going into the DMT study with the hope. Um, of having a, you know, near death, you know, like experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so her case was the most classic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going you know, through a tunnel, beings on the side, uh, threatening and supporting. Um, it was a yellow light up in front. Um, 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 it wasn't white. And, uh, the, the one volunteer, you know, that had an enlightenment kind of experience, was a religious uh, studies major in college and was quite spiritually inclined and wanted an enlightenment experience. It was his life's you know, goal to yeah. enter into the white light. And and uh, the one classical enlightenment kind of experience with uh, volunteers in the DMT stu uh, study took place with him. So that suggests, of course, that the, the years of preparation that a person has in uh, their own self-cultivation prior to this experience makes a big difference. Well, it you know, brings up a couple of points. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one is that point exactly. You know, uh, you know um, that, you know, DMT or, you know, any psychedelic drug works on the person's mind. What's already there? It might be conscious, might be pre-conscious, might be unconscious. You know, but it's already there. 
Well, you know, which is one of the reasons that psychedelics never turned out to be good Manchurian candidate brainwashing drugs. Mm. Because you can't turn a peaceful person into a killer. It's very difficult. Yeah. You can turn a killer into a you know, more dedicated you know, killer, you know, more devoted to the cause. But uh, you're starting with, you know, the raw material of the person's mind. You, you know, one of the reasons these drugs are called, uh, uh, are, are, you know, called psychedelic is that it means mind manifesting or yeah. mind disclosing. It, uh, you know, it, it shines the light and hypertrophies, amplifies, stimulates, uh, certain things which are already there. Mm-hmm. You know, so the nurse with the NDE experience had been, you know, building up to an NDE and the drug provided the springboard. Uh, the other, you know, fellow with the enlightenment experience wanted an enlightenment experience. He had, uh, studied them, worked on them through his meditation to attain them, and the drug just, you know, took him to the next, uh, step. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you, you know, that is one of the important take-home lessons of our DMT work. Uh, because nobody really is giving drugs and just observing their effects. They're giving, you know, psychedelics, uh, you know, for a reason, mm-hmm. either to induce a mystical state, to help end of life distress, to study ego disillusion. Uh, but, you know, you know, nobody is just, you know, giving a drug and saying, you know, what was that like? Um, and, uh, with almost no preparation other than it's very fast, it's over quickly, and you may fear for, for your life, but don't worry. Other than that, I said, just have your own trip. Mm-hmm. Um, and people had their own trips. Some people that were, you know, nihilistic became even more so. Some people who wanted to change careers, they were thinking about it, said, you know, um, it's the obvious thing to do. And yeah. they went ahead and did it. Um, you know, so in a way, uh, and this has to do with the, you know, placebo effect, which we were, you know, talking about earlier. Yes. Is, is, is there works on, your goals and aspirations. If you're going into a study to become less depressed, everything is, you know, geared towards you becoming less depressed. And you have this profound experience mm-hmm. and uh, you feel less depressed. You know, so, you know, whether or not the drug is an antidepressant or it's just taking people to a level of their own inherent you know, healing mechanisms that they weren't able to attain to before mm-hmm. uh, is an important question. Back in the um, early days, uh, there was a lot of interest in the use of psychedelics in combination with psychotherapy. Right, and that's the majority of you know, therapy projects that are occurring you know nowadays. Uh, mm-hmm. That uh, there have been studies out of NYU, out of Hopkins, out of UNM, you know, treating addictions, uh, treating end of life distress, uh, and. Um, those studies spend a lot of time educating people ahead of time, mm-hmm. you know, preparing them, establishing you know, psycho th- mm-hmm. uh, you know, psychotherapeutic rapport. Mm-hmm. What do you want to work on? What things about your life do you want to change? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are you afraid of? You know, might happen. You know, what do you hope will happen? You know, so there's you know ten to twelve weeks of that. You know, so then you get, you know, the drug and you've got, you know, therapists in their room working with you, you know, doing motivational interviewing, let's say. Uh, and then when you come down, you have a lot of follow up. Uh, people, you know, keep an eye on the symptoms that you came in initially for, for treatment. You know, so everything is, is, you know, geared, you know, towards the attainment of a specific, you know, goal. Mm-hmm. And in our study, we, just didn't. We just you know, said the goal is to characterize the subjective experience. Mm-hmm. So when you're looking at these drugs, you know, benefits, it's important to uh, you know, separate out the you know, set and the setting, the expectation and the effect of the mm-hmm. drug. They are inextricably bound. So I am under the impression that, uh, I mean, you, you did your important research nearly 30 years ago that these days, uh, it's more common. There is quite a bit of research on psychedelics. Uh, a huge amount. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. In America, in England, uh, Europe, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, ayahuasca research in Brazil, uh, yeah, NYU, Hopkins are studying psilocybin. 
um, Yale's about to perhaps start a DMT study. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I began, you know, might rise from the ashes again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, many years ago, I did an interview with Houston Smith, the philosopher who was part of the initial clique of people in the Boston area right. uh, doing LSD research. And he did a study where it was called a Q sort. He had descriptions from the classical literature of mystical experiences and then descriptions of psychedelic experience. And Mm -hmm. he had them typed up in little, I suppose, five by three by five cards or something. And he'd have people say, can you sort these? Which ones are psychedelic and which ones are from the classical mystical experience? Mm -hmm. And, and he determined that uh, the psychologists involved in, in the QSORT couldn't. They could not make a distinction uh, based on the experience itself. But if you looked at the lives of, you know, the great saints and uh, mystics, uh, one of the differences he saw was they took that experience and they they built a whole legacy around it, a whole lifestyle where uh, you didn't get that with psychedelic users typically. Right, right. I think Smith is the one who coined the notion you can have a mystical experience, but that's not the same as a mystical life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Q sort, you know, data are interesting, uh, because you didn't know the pre-existing personality of those who took, you know, psychedelics. Right. You know, they may have been quite interested in mysticism. They may have read James, uh, you know, William James. They may have been, you know, reading Houston Smith. Uh, they may have been, uh, interested in Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita, mm. Zen. Yeah, you know, so, you know, they may have been keen on a mystical experience, and that's why they took, you know, psychedelics in the first place. Well, I can say just, you know, personally, for what it's worth, I was such a person. I, I was studying mysticism and higher states of consciousness as an undergraduate and ended up uh, taking psychedelics back then, and in fact, quite a bit. Uh, but it propelled me on a, on a lifelong quest to understand consciousness and uh, to devote myself to the work I'm doing now in these interviews that have been doing for decades. Well, I think it's important to, you know, to not go overboard with this mystical experience and the you know, psychedelic effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it even makes you wish there weren't you know, such a term or an idea as experience. You know, because experience kind of implies that it's you know separated from everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, the experience lasted eight hours. Yeah, you know, so you might have a, an ex, an experience on drugs, which you know checks off all the boxes for a full blown mystical experience. Mm-hmm. But you know that is not really a myst. You know, like it's the difference between a mystical life and a mystical experience. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do with that? Uh, you know, with the after effects. Um, so, the you know term I prefer using when I review manuscripts for journal articles is insist they say mystical mimetic mm. as opposed to you know mystical, uh, because I think you know calling it mystical gives it you know too much you know, theological credence, mm-hmm. which I don't think at this point it deserves. Mm-hmm. Well, originally psychedelic drugs were referred to as psychomimetic; uh, they, they seem to mimic a psychotic state. Well, yeah, yeah, and you know that's a great point. Uh, you know, depending on what you're looking for mm-hmm. and the questionnaires you give, you can establish that you know DMT you know, mimics features of schizophrenia. There was a study with, that was you know, published you know, 15 years ago uh, in Germany, and they were interested in seeing if you know psychedelics and schizophrenia resembled each other, and lo and behold, they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, they gave questionnaires for schizophrenia. They scored high on the DMT effect, you know. So you can call them uh, schizotoxic, psychotomimetic, uh, yeah. And uh, depending what you're looking for, depending on the rating scales, depending yeah. on the questions you know, that you ask, mm-hmm. you know, then you will usually be uh, confirmed mm-hmm. in your uh, hypothesis. Which is another, you know, good example of how these drugs just may be super placebos. They, you know, give you what you're looking for mm-hmm. and what you want. In, in a way, it's, you know, kind of spilling over, you know, to the researchers too. 
Yeah, you know, because they're you know seeing what what you know, they're looking what, for, what huh? they want. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, but the people in the studies do certainly uh, usually end up uh, with the results that both they and the research mm-hmm. you know, team are interested in. Now, a percentage of the uh, times in which you administer DMT or psilocybin, uh, people had bad trips or even painful experiences. <laughs> Uh, yeah, th- you know, there were a couple of acute <clears throat> adverse reactions and a couple of ones that came on like a few days later. Mm-hmm. One person, uh, you know, developed, you know, some panic attacks the next day after we, you know, gave him that, you know, dose of DMT that, you know, turned out to be too high. You know, but he worked on them himself and uh, returned to the study and, you know, was able to work them through. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of people, you know, with a history of depression became depressed again after one high dose. One person got back into therapy, resolved the issues right away. One guy got back on antidepressants and felt, you know, fine in a week or so. Um, one person, uh, really was terrified. He was raped by crocodiles, anally raped by crocodiles, was pinned to the bed. I mean, that was his visionary experience. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, that was scary for him. We had no idea that that was happening as it was taking place. He just opened up his eyes and said, that was the most awful experience of my life. Mm-hmm. And he started, you know, discussing it. Yeah, you know, so we, you know, kept an eye on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he came in, we, you know, we talked. Uh, and he, you know, seemed to be a pretty happy-go-lucky guy most of the time and kind of, you know, sealed over and, uh, you know, did fine. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, you know, so, you know, 400 doses, uh, and five dozen volunteers, I think we had a pretty good, uh, you know, rate, you know, tolerable you know, so rate. Of- it sounds like over 90% of the time people's experiences were positive. Yeah, at least, you know, 90% of the time. Mm-hmm. And I do attribute a lot of that to the screening mm-hmm. and the preparation and the establishment of rapport. Still, you know, didn't prevent, uh, you know, adverse effects. Uh, in a handful of people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, these are very powerful drugs. And uh, any attempt to make them more available, you know, liberally, uh, I think has to be, you know, debated mm-hmm. quite uh, intelligently. It's not as if you're advocating decriminalization. Um, do I advocate decriminalization? I think it's a little early. Uh-huh. Yeah, we still don't know enough about the you know, best way to administer, to take these drugs. Uh, I think, you know, the progress of, you know, science is, you know, moving forward. It's slow, though, and I don't blame people for being impatient. You know, it, it reminds me of the Huxley-Leary debate, uh, you know, back in the day. You know, like Aldous Huxley said, only the elite should take psychedelics. Only they could handle it. Only, you know, they could be able to utilize it, make the world a better place. And, you know, Tim said, you know, Open the floodgates. Anybody who wants to take them should be able to take them. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think we're still in that, de- you know, debate. You know, like, you know, how much are you going to control, you know, the access? So I think it's just if you're more, you know, cautious, you go one way. If you're less cautious, maybe, or you have, you know, better, you know, faith in human potential, human nature. Uh, you know, um, a lot of us would never have been able to have been exposed to these, you know, drugs without, the, you know, the Tim Leary approach. Yeah. And if, if it all stayed in the ivory tower, uh, a lot fewer people would have, you know, had these experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, with regard to the mechanism of psychedelic drugs, I, I gather that you, a lot of your research was designed to see how, how they impacted different brain receptors. Uh, what did you end up concluding about that? A number of the objective, you know, variables which we measured were theoretically under the control of the serotonin system. Mm-hmm. You know, the hormones, uh, the pupil diameter, the heart rate changes. Once we had, you know, gathered, you know, so-called, you know, uh, uh, you know, normative data, uh, you know, what are the effects of a range of doses? We could then start, you know, you know, to manipulate, um, you know, the serotonin system. Uh, you could block one receptor, you could augment the other receptor, and then, you know, compare responses in that state with just the pure DMT, with, mm-hmm. the, with just the pure, you know, DMT state by itself. With no receptors being blocked. Right. Mm-hmm. There aren't any receptors being blocked. Yeah. 
know, there are quite a few you know, subtypes of you know, serotonin receptor out there. At the time that I was doing the work, I think we knew about you know, seven of them. Mm-hmm. I think there's maybe 12 known and, now. And the reason that you're looking at serotonin receptors in the first place, I gather, is that uh, DMT and other psychedelics are really part of the same uh, chemical family as serotonin. They're quite close structurally, mm-hmm. you know, what you know, they look like, um, uh, um, you know, their formula. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and their you know, pharmacology is quite uh, uh, you know, similar, too. Uh, a lot of the details of the serotonin system was worked out using LSD in lower animals mm-hmm. during that 20-year period. You know, so the, you know, the majority of the animal data and the early human data supported a role you know, for serotonin. Uh, as, you know, mediating its effects. And, you know, th- and, um, you know, so that is why we, you know, pinpointed, you know, that particular system. We began by blockading one of the serotonin receptors. Uh, and, uh, it's very interesting. It amplified the effect of DMT by a factor of two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so that's the importance of, you know, knowing what smaller doses do mm-hmm. because we could give smaller doses if the effect was amplified and still be able to make, you know, cogent comparisons. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so it multiplied the you know, psychological effect by two and the you know, blood pressure re- uh, effect. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, it increased you know, the sensitivity mm-hmm. um, you know, to DMT. Certain receptors, and I, I gather other receptors had the opposite effect. The one study we did complete, in addition to the other serotonin blocking one, was one in which we attempted to develop tolerance to closely spaced repeated doses of DMT. Um, when you give LSD every day, you stop responding after a few days. Mm-hmm. It's what's called tolerance. You have to increase the dose. You know to you know to get the earlier effect. Yeah, and and even after you're in in increasing the dose, after you've you've taken LSD like for a week every day, you just don't respond. Hmm. Uh, this, you know that had never been established with um, you know giving DMT. Uh, um, even in a cat study, they gave it every two hours for 21 days, no tolerance. Uh, they tried a study in humans giving it you know twice a day. You know, th- you know, this was at NIMH in uh, th- the early 70s, um, and there was no tolerance. So I thought, well, maybe we just have to space the intervals, you know, closer yeah. together. You know, so the half-life of DMT is about eight minutes or so. We, you know, did some calculations, thought, well, every half hour, mm-hmm. and, you know, let's see how that goes. Yeah, and, you know, we gave her, it, um, you know, so we gave her it every half hour, no tolerance. Uh, you know, people got as intoxicated on the fourth dose as on the first one. Unlike other psychedelics. Unlike other psychedelics, which I think, you know, ties in to the role of DMT in the human body. Mm-hmm. Because if it was being produced around the clock, you, uh, you know, then you shouldn't be able to develop tolerance to it. You would think it would, you know, just, you know, continue, you know, to um, exert its effect. Mm-hmm. It would, you know, be as if you became, you know, tolerant to serotonin. You know, you know, uh, so if, we if all it, have DMT in our bodies, but not at the psychedelic threshold generally. Well, it's been quite, you know, difficult, you know, to measure the levels of DMT in the blood in, in the human. Uh, they're really very, very low. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a, you know, billionth of a gram, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, per milliliter. You know, so, th- I mean, even though there were a lot of studies that, you know, that were able, you know, to demonstrate measurable amounts of DMT in blood, you know, the assay technology, the, you know, sensitivity, specificity of the instrument that was doing, you know, the measurements may not have been up to scratch. Mm-hmm. You know, so what they're doing, you know, nowadays is looking at the gene expression that makes the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of DMT. And just a few months ago, there was a group in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, you know, the University of Michigan there, which, you know, demonstrated, you know, synthesis of DMT in the rodent brain in concentrations comparable to the normal neurotransmitters like serotonin and of dopamine, which, you know, broaches the possibility of a DMT, you know, neurotransmitter system mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, the mammalian brain, mm-hmm. which opens up a whole can of worms in, 
epistemological, you know, questions about the nature of our perception of reality and mm -hmm. a whole, you know, host of, uh, you know, other important issues. Mm -hmm. You developed a, a hypothesis that DMT is normally manufactured in the pineal gland. These recent, you know, find, uh, you know findings are even more important, I think. Uh, because it's establishing that, you know, DMT you know, can be made in the brain of the mammal mm -hmm. in quite high levels. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the pineal, you know, theory was attractive because of, you know, the esoteric significance of the pineal gland, you know, through the millennia. Uh, -huh. uh but, you know, there are plenty of, you know, people without pineal glands, either from cancer or from strokes, who are pretty normal. They dream. They're not crazy. They're as, you know, creative as anybody else. The main finding of those people is it's harder for them to recover from uh, intercontinental you know, you know, travel. Uh -huh. uh, you know, jet lag isn't uh, as easily uh, you know, fixed. And people take melatonin for that purpose often. Right, right. You know, so if you know, they're missing melatonin, you know, they have you know, some symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, it isn't like they, you know, they're missing DMT. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well... I presume that as a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist yourself, that you, you're pretty much approaching this issue from the uh, perspective of materialism, from, uh, material science, uh, how chemicals affect the brain, how the brain affects consciousness. Uh, I'm guessing at least you started that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I started that way for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, you know, reasons was eminently, uh, uh, you know, practical. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I couldn't, you know, say I'm interested in the biology of spiritual experience. Um, it, you know, needed to be, or, or just, you know, purely spiritual experience. Um, it, I, it required, you know, some scientific, you know, grounding. Sure. You're dealing with all kinds of bureaucratic institutions. Right. And I wanted to make certain all my I's were dotted, all my T's were crossed, you know, that, you know, nothing went wrong. I wanted to, you know, uh, you know, to preserve the, uh, you know, two year, you know, process, you know, for others to, uh, you know, follow suit. Um, it was really important for me to do it in a non controversial way. In fact, the study, in a lot of ways, if you read it, is kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, you know, third person. Yeah. You know, no adjectives, you know, you, you know, there aren't any adverbs. It's, yeah. you know, quite technical. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always liked, you know, chemistry. Uh, when I was a kid, I made bombs and, you know, fireworks. <laughs> uh, went to college as mm -hmm. a chemistry major thinking I would start my own, you know, fireworks dynasty. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and everybody said, you know, forget that. You're smart. You should be a doctor. So I, in, in a way, I, I you know, got the last laugh. Uh, because I was able to, you know, work on internal fireworks. Yeah, but, you, you know. have a fireworks <laughs> dynasty, so to speak. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I got the last laugh on that uh -huh. one. Um, yeah, you know, so the chemistry was, you know, fascinating. And, you know, pharmacology, endocrinology, I just, you know, loved those, you know, topics in medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a natural combination of interest in spirituality and, uh, you know, psychopharmacology. You know, once I established that, you know, DMT wasn't inherently spiritual. I was, you know, thinking that it was a spiritual pharmacology. You, you just you you refer know, to it as the spirit molecule in your first book. Uh, right. I mean, that's what I was hoping, thinking. I think in, you know, some ways it helps explain spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, but in another, uh, it isn't the, you know, compound itself. It's the interaction of the compound with a, you know, with a person's mind. It yeah. can be spiritual or it could be anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so once I discovered that, like, uh, you know, I was hoping, like, you know, kind of dumb, but still I was hoping. You give a drug, hands off, people are enlightened, purely from the drug. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking, wouldn't this be great? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, gave the drug, you know, hands off, and it just was all over the map. Mm -hmm. So it was like, this is a way more complicated, you know, that I'm interested in, uh, you know, getting into. I'm just, you know, one guy. Uh, small team, uh, I've answered the question. You know, like, these, you know, drugs are working on the, you know, set and the setting. And I don't have the manpower to, you know, get a big, you know, psychotherapy team together. It isn't available at UNM. Uh, it was, you know, hard to attract peers, you know, to come out 
you know, you know, to the middle of you know nowhere, and you're so f- and you're so far ahead of the game, uh, or you know the curve that it, it was hard for people to understand what we had accomplished. So it was kind of like I had you know gotten you know the answer to the most burning question, mm-hmm. like are these drugs inherently spiritual? And it was no. So I then thought, well. Other people can work out the mechanics now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they could figure out what receptor, mm-hmm. what part of the brain. It's you know, it's you know, once I was able to open up the door to human studies, the you know, mechanisms, at least the you know, biological ones, are simply a matter of wiring and plumbing. Mm-hmm. If you ask me, it's quite complex, but it excludes the mind. Yeah. And I'm more interested in the mental state that facilitates the results that you're seeking. Well, fortunately, while you're here in Albuquerque, we'll do another interview focusing much more on that. My pleasure. Be great. Well, Dr. Rick Strassman, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of experience and research on what I regard as a very important topic. Well, thanks, Jeff. It was great. I appreciate it. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.